Okay, hey everybody, welcome to our panel. We're excited to have you here. Uh, my name is Melissa Logan. I'm the director of the Data on Kubernetes community. If you are not familiar with our community, uh, it's about 4,000 end users and practitioners who are sharing best practices about running stateful workloads on Kubernetes, all kinds of stateful workloads, um, databases, streaming, AIML, analytics, et cetera. We host monthly um, virtual and in-person meetups. Um, we have folks from uh, different end users sharing their case studies about how they run successfully um, data workloads on Kubernetes. We've had folks like Comcast, um, PayitGov, Dutch government, others like that join us. Uh, really good learning for the community. We are very soon going to launch a new website that has a resource library that will catalog the different um, talks that we've had, and you can, you'll be able to search by type of workload you're looking for. So really just trying to pr pr uh, share resources for you all as you're going on your DOK journey. Um, we also host an operator special interest group. Um, the purpose of this group is to identify gaps in knowledge and information and see what we can do about it as a community. These are members of our operator SIG here today, and we're gonna talk with you about operator maturity. Um, and we're gonna share just some practical advice as you're evaluating operators, um, what to look out for. So let's just start with some introductions. Um, tell us who you are and what is your background with operators. Michelle. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Michelle. I'm a software engineer at Google. I work on GKE and open source Kubernetes, um, where I'm a six storage TL. And so my main um, exposure to operators is we have lots of users that come and want to run stateful workloads and with all sorts of different types of workloads. And you know they're basically asking for best practices. And one of my goals is to kind of pick out all the challenges that all the users are hitting, try to find common patterns across um, all the different types of workloads, and then bring, um, you know, make Kubernetes better to be able to support those workloads in the future. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Hodges. I run a data warehouse sta uh, startup. We are service providers for ClickHouse, a pretty popular database. Um, my involvement in Kubernetes and operators is that about five years ago, we made a decision to basically push all of our workloads onto Kubernetes and because we saw that as the platform of the future. I say we, but actually, personally, I thought it was kind of a dubious idea to run databases on Kubernetes. Since then, though, we developed what turned out to be the first operator for a data warehouse. That came out about four and a half years ago, and it's turned out to be a really great experience. We've learned a huge amount of stuff along the way. Um, I'm actually doing a talk on storage uh, for data warehouses in a couple hours, so. Thanks, Thanks Robert. I'm Gabriele Bartolini. I'm VP of Cloud Native at EDB. EDB is a company that develops the open source Postgres. And I've been using Postgres for 23 years now. And so, as Robert, you know, was saying, you know, databases, primarily I've seen the whole bare metal VM evolution. And four, year and a half ago, four years and a half ago, I started my Kubernetes initiative. And uh, the idea was to fail fast. So to see if this could actually be an area to explore. And we, we tried to see if Kubernetes and Postgres on, in Kubernetes could run on bare metal machines. So we did uh, a benchmark on bare metal Kubernetes cluster. And we saw that, you know, Things were improved, and with local persistent volumes, it was pretty much the same thing as running on bare metal. And that's where we started to develop an operator for Postgres, which is Cloud Native PG. It's open source, and yeah, here we are. Excellent. Uh, so I just want to start with some context. So how many people here are familiar with the operator framework? Okay. So almost everybody, it seems like. Um, we just so the operator framework. If you're not familiar, it has different levels of how the operate what the operators enable for people. Level one is just basic install, and it goes up to level five. We had run a survey um, a year ago in the data on Kubernetes community, and it showed that people want their operators to function at a very high level. So they want them to operate at levels three, four, and five. 
So that's um, full lifecycle management, deep insights, and autopilot. Um, so can you all just kind of t give us some more context here, like what, what do those things enable? What are you seeing um, with regard to how we categorize operators? Sure, I can go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, definitely the level five autopilot, I think, is a very aspirational goal that we'd all like to uh, get to where, where basically everything is self-healing and self-managing and you basically don't have to touch it ever once you start. I think that's... It's a really good goal. Um, I don't know if it's realistically going to be achievable, but I mean, it's a great North Star to get to. I think um, I, I do see operators today that are able to get some parts of level five. Um, and so we're, we're getting there. And I think also in Kubernetes, there's still um, a number of places we can improve Kubernetes to make it easier for operators to get to level five as well. Yeah, so we started, well, kind of like Gabriele, we started our operator development long before any of this, uh, these frameworks existed. Uh, so we didn't really think in those terms. But I will say that looking back and kind of reverse engineering onto what we have, levels three and four are extremely important. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that we do is we provide built-in observability. Uh, the operator almost from the start had a Prometheus exporter that you could, you know, as you spun up your database clusters, they would just start magically uh, exporting their metrics into Prometheus. Uh, we supply dashboards on top of that. I think that's one of the biggest value adds, um, and particularly for large systems in Kubernetes where you can't just go and lay hands on things, that's a really critical feature. Obviously, DR backup and things like that are critical as well. Yeah, so, and for example, I'm, I'm gonna use my uh, our operator as an, uh, you know, to, to, to reply to this question. Uh, we use the operator framework, operator capability level framework to classify the features, okay? So, so we saw because customers and users are familiar to this model, so we decided to have, if you actually go in the Cloud Native PG documentation, you, ha you see a page that classifies all the capabilities according to these levels. So um, I really like um, this morning's uh, keynote, uh, from my team from, from uh, Google, and he said something, you know, like Kubernetes uh, will never be finished, okay? So I think, like, you know, Michelle was saying, uh, uh, this is kind of an aspirational goal. Level five is really, will never stop, okay? But it's important for me, level three, the, you know, day two operations, so especially backup and recovery, and with level five, um, self-feeling and, and automated failover for a database that has primary and standby. And observability is very important. So we have even our operator as a default Prometheus exporter and we export logs in JSON uh, to integrate directly with any solution you can use for, for monitoring and logging, tra tracing and, and so forth. So, yeah. So when you are evaluating an operator, what are the key things that you typically look for? How do you understand whether it's gonna fit in your stack? Um, I think for me, when I talk to a lot of users, the biggest challenges that they have with stateful workloads is handling disruptions. And so I think when I'm you know, trying to recommend operators to customers, um, I think that's one of the first things I tell them about, like test and evaluate and see if the operators are able to recover gracefully from both planned and unplanned um, failures and disruptions, um, because that's something um, that I think is pretty critical to evaluate. And that's probably gonna be one of the biggest source of production issues that people will run to. Yeah, I think, um... With operators, I like all software, I tend to look for things that have production use behind them. So uh, to take our operator, for example, we use, it, we use it for our own cloud. So we've been running it for three years. Uh, these are clusters where people are running servers with up to 50 terabytes of block storage attached to them and really heavy load. There are other clouds actually. IBM runs a big internal service as a Chinese, uh, one of the Chinese uh, uh, ClickHouse services runs on our operator. 
Uh, so you want something that's been tested uh, because they're, they're, particularly when you're running at load and in, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. So that's a, that's a really key thing. And I think that's more important than particular features, although those are obviously important as well. I don't know if we're going to go into stacks, but the other thing that we are starting to, that I'm starting to look at is how does the operator fit in to the entire stack? Because normally you don't just stand up a data warehouse and call it good. You're actually building a service that's, that's designed to do analytics and is in some sense a replacement for something like Snowflake but just for a particular purpose. So the question is, how does that operator and the software it manage, manages fit into the entire stack? For example, does it integrate with Argo CD, stuff like that? So those, that's the second thing I would look at. Yep, and uh, yeah, I agree with Robert, and also the, the pipelines, I would say. You know, I think, for example, in our operator, we have put a lot of focus since day one to automated pipelines that also have automated tests. So our, our operator runs in continuous delivery, so continuous delivery is a state of mind, you know, for, for a team that develops a software, that the latest commit is always the most stable version of your software. Okay, so to be there, having, having managed 24-7 support for years and producing hot fixes, uh, it was always good to know that you could commit your hotfix to the latest version of latest commit of your software and ship it. Okay, so continue to get to continuous delivery, you need automated testing and you need strong pipelines. So um, I think that this is also an important um, thing to see that shows how many, for example, look at how many end to end tests are done in, in the software you are deploying and, and make your own judgment, you know. And of course, the operator capability level framework to see, you know, if the operator is production ready. And then uh, again, day day three operation. So for a database, it's important to look at, uh, yeah, performance, but also uh, RPO, RTO, so high availability and disaster recovery. So backup recovery and so on. So these are the things I would look and, and, and security, but I think we can. <laughs> Security is very important as well. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I know, so on Operator Hub, there's about 240, 250 operators now. For Postgres alone, I know there's maybe five, six different operators. So in the case where there are multiple operators available, how do, how do you suggest people evaluate and determine which one to use? I think a, a big one for me would be sort of the support of the operator and the community health. Um, how, you know, how big is the community um, that's contributing to this operator or what is the sort of support contracts that are available? Because I think one of the, po the kind of misconceptions I think of operators is that like you don't need any expertise if, and you can just run an operator and it'll take care of everything. But I, I think, you know, that that's where some people run into trouble because when things go wrong, you still need to be able to debug and you need the expertise of that workload to be able to go in. And so either like you need to develop that expertise or you need to, you know, get support uh, from someone that has that expertise. Okay, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my advice is to actually look at all of them and possibly try and install all of them and then make your own judgment. <clears throat> there are, yeah, there are several operators for Postgres. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, it's not easy for me to speak, uh, you know, like without being, you know, this, uh, subjective, but yeah, but anyway. Um, yeah, I think I would say ju just try, try them all, look at the features, and, and yeah, make your own judgment. So, yeah. I want to riff on that slightly, which is an alternative question is, what if there's only one? Is it safe? You know, is, can you use it? And I think one of the things for any operator is to, you know, as you're, as you're looking at it, think about, can I wrap my head around running this thing? So, for example, is it documented? 
Um, we talked about tests, but those are a great way to figure out, well, provided the tests are something comprehensible, those are often a good way to, to figure out how it works. Can you see blog articles? Can you see, you know, things that are going to help you integrate this into your um, development process, CI, CD, um, and then the final services that you deploy. So those are things I would look at really hard. And if you don't feel convinced, then don't use it. There's other ways to run software. Yeah, and then, I mean, on, on top of these, I think, yeah, it's important to, every, every organization is unique, okay? So, um, and for example, our operator has taken a completely different direction than the others. And, and so I think it, it's good to see if you, how, many, how much Kubernetes knowledge you have in your team, how much Postgres knowledge you have in your team, because probably, especially the direction that we have to leverage the Kubernetes API. If you come from a Postgres background, for example, our operator might be a bit uh, intimidating, okay? Because we're not, we're trying to go in the direction that we don't use any Postgres tool also for backups. So we don't use any Postgres tool for automated failover. So if you have been using, for example, Patroni for years or other backup tools, you feel more, you feel in your comfort zone, okay? But the, the, we are trying to actually reuse what Kubernetes offers. And two days ago with Michelle, we did a presentation about very large database disaster recovery. And I have been working in the, in the backup and recovery area for many years in Postgres. And Kubernetes for the first time has given us the possibility to use a standard interface for snapshots. Okay, that's not possible outside. Every vendor has in its own way to take snapshots. And we restored 4.4, restore we can restore 4.5 terabytes in two minutes. Okay, thanks to Kubernetes. Thanks to, you know, delegate the, the task, you know, to Kubernetes, what Kubernetes has been designed for. So I think, yeah, it depends on the skills you have, how comfortable you feel with one operator or the other based on the main uh, capabilities. So. Yeah, and I think we, we've heard in our community two people write their own custom operators, and it's, it's relatively easy to start this, but then maintaining it and, and keeping it going. Don't, I think for all the start. reasons that we're talking about here, <laughs> it's very challenging. <laughs> don't um, start, yeah, a custom operator, for, especially for Postgres. And use an operator. My, adv my advice is not to run Postgres without an operator because you miss all the integration stuff that operators enable you to, to benefit from. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think, so what, what are the challenges that, as you're um, beginning to evaluate or use an operator, what are the challenges that you typically see or run into? How, how do we solve those challenges? You mentioned, for example, understanding Kubernetes skills, understanding those types of things. Are the, what else do you see as challenges of running an operator, maintaining an operator? Uh, I mean, when it comes to databases, there's still the perception that we can't run them. Okay, that's why we're here. It's not only possible, in my opinion, as I said the other day, I will never go back to bare metal and VMs to run Postgres, okay? So this is a strong statement, okay? But you need skills. Yeah, I think skills are Kubernetes skills. And they don't need to be necessarily in, in one person. I love the concept of team, T-shaped profiles. So maybe you have a team with Postgres experts that work together with Kubernetes experts. And also the DBA profile, the DBA skills need to be reshaped. As I always say to DBA people, you, you are elevated thanks to Kubernetes because you are not doing the, the, the boring stuff you were forced to do that you, you think that was your job. No, your job was not that. You had to do it because there's no, there was no better way to do it. But now you can go back to work more closely with developers, uh, work on indexes, work on monitoring, observability, alerting, and most, in my opinion, live a better life. Because you 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 know, you will That's be the ultimate paged. Goal. Huh? Ultimate goal: live a better life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you will be paged less if you do things properly with Kubernetes and and a good operator. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, definitely with Gabrielli that I, you know, having started out thinking this is a, not a good idea to run on Kubernetes, I would absolutely never go back. We do a lot of performance testing. We have completely shifted all of that on. To Kubernetes, we never do uh, 
almost never do uh, performance testing anywhere else because we can set things up, change configurations, scale storage up, you know, change VM sizes. It's it's really wonderful for that. I think just in terms of the challenges, it also as a as a DBA or somebody accustomed to running databases, there definitely is a mind shift. We, we already mentioned that you have to know Kubernetes. There's just things that you need to know, like what is that CSI driver doing in the same sense that you need to understand storage. Um, but I think there's also another type of mind shift where the traditional model for fixing something on a database like Oracle is, hey, you know, just SSH in and run S-trace or, you know, use your standard, you know, uh, yeah, LSOF, find out what the heck is going in on that, going on on that host. You can't do that in Kubernetes. So there's a huge premium. I think one of the big shifts is you you switch from this notion to go in and lay hands on things to having observability. So if you need to, if you think you're like exceeding load average, and that's why, you, or you're getting oomed, um, you want to have like Grafana dashboards that are showing you this stuff that you can just go straight to and, and find out what the problem is. It forces you to be better, but I think if you're used to doing it the, you know, the traditional way, for a while you're gonna to try to, you know, coop cuddle exec and to fix things, and then you'll realize that just doesn't scale. So you really need to think in terms of things that allow you to diagnose problems remotely and not have to actually touch the, you know, touch the host where, where things are running. Yeah. That, uh, can I say one thing about this? I mean, this is just because I think it's about feedback loops with the people that use the, uh, it's unexplored territory in my, my opinion. Okay, so in the next years, I think we, this will be clearer. But for example, we had to change our operator to go clo get closer to DBAs and introduce fencing. Fencing, for example, is a way that Postgres is down, but a DBA can access uh, the data files and see if there's corruption. Okay, so this is an exercise that it's been done thanks to the cooperation between these two different ways of thinking uh, a database. Yeah, I would agree with um, everything that's been said so far. I think um, like troubleshooting and debugging is, is kind of one of the bigger mind shifts and, and you know, trying to troubleshoot with Kubernetes pod is, you know, different set of skills and I think um, one of the interesting challenges is when like there's some problem and you have to go in and actually fix the system uh, sometimes operators you might be fighting against operators because operators might be trying to do self-healing while you're like going and trying to go in the same time and like try to run some other commands and things and so I think that that can definitely be a challenge um, I think that's an area maybe where uh, there could be, you know, more improvement from the operator space to be able to support those kinds of routines. Let's talk about security then. Um, so in our data and Kubernetes survey from last year, we asked about the criteria people use to evaluate operators, and security was the number one criteria. Um, so I'm curious, what, does, what do operators provide related to security? What, what's kind of built in in different operators, or what would you expect to find? Um, I think definitely like where operators can really shine is sort of having secure by default settings and making it really easy to automate all the configuration for that. Um, at the same time, I think there's an interesting kind of challenge in that operators um, have been designed to sort of, a lot of operators have been designed to spin up new instances of databases and other workloads. But operators themselves need a lot of permissions to be able to do things like create pods in any namespace or create and delete pods in any namespace. And so I think there, I, I'm, I think there will be a sort of a shift coming where even operators themselves, um, their permissions that they need will be sort of um, more scrutinized and people will be asking for more features like limiting the namespaces that operators have access to and, and things like that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, the notion of enforcing secure by default. So to give a concrete example, our operator, there's a default user uh, for ClickHouse as there is for just about every database that ever existed. And so what we do is we fence that default user so that you can only use that account when you're on the local host, like you're actually on the pod 
or if you're calling from one of the other hosts in the cluster, that's just that those network filters are just set up by default. So you want to have concrete things like that, and you want to have them just enabled automatically. I think another thing that's really critical for operators to do is to integrate well with the existing mechanisms for security in Kubernetes, which Kubernetes has a very rich security model. Um, you know, there's notions of roles, there's uh, notions of things like secrets, um, and so you want to leverage those those features. What do I mean by that? Well, people can, so if, for example, if you need to pass credentials in for S3, a common way to do it is just to put them in the environment. Um, that's actually pretty easy to apply as long as the operator allows you to get in and manipulate the pod specification. So what I'm saying is you don't want to have an operator that hides the fact that underneath there's one or more pod specifications. It needs to give you an escape hatch to go in and apply the security. Same thing if you're getting secrets out of HashiCorp Vault. Uh, so operators need to have these openings that allow them to mesh uh, easily and conveniently with these security mechanisms that maybe you're using across your entire cluster and are very good. And um, on top of that, they need to have documentation. So there's, there's many others, but those, that's something that's pretty high up my list to look at. Yeah, and uh, when I usually try and define our posture in security, I usually, I use the 4C security model of Kubernetes, so cloud, cluster, um, container, and code. So it actually starts from the code, so code needs to be scanned, um, images that are built needs, need, need to be scanned. When we go to the container layer, we, for example, our operator uses immutable application containers, so they only run one command at a time. Uh, the other day somebody was asking me for troubleshooting. I tried to run PS, and your operator doesn't allow me to run PS, because that doesn't exist. Because we try to build very minimal images. Uh, the, the database, so when the database is run in the container, we, by default, we disable Postgres super user. Um, then we use secrets. We use mutual TLS to let the replicas uh, talk to each other, so we don't even use passwords. Then when we go to the cluster level, our back, so what what um, Michelle said is very interesting because if you actually look at the documentation of our operator, we had to specify all the permissions that our operator requires and even point to the source code because that's the level of scrutiny that our customers want, you know, require. They need to know, especially with an operand like ours, they need to talk to the operator to coordinate. Okay, so we need to say, okay, we need these permissions because of this, this, and that, okay? And documentation is where you put it. And then the cloud level, but that I leave it aside because it's, it's uh, for the infrastructure level. You know. Well, and beyond the basic built-in stuff, um, what are other security best practices that you want to think of or op about for operators? And I'm asking this because we, as a, an operator, SIG, have been working on an operator security hardening guide, and so I'd love to hear what are some other things that we want to think about related to best practices with security? I'm going to jump in on this. I, I think one kind of interesting area for uh, security of databases on Kubernetes is actually thinking about exported data. Um, and, you know, I mentioned observability, uh, that includes logs. So logs in databases often have quite sensitive information in them and you're happily shipping them off to, I don't know, Sentry or something like that. So there's, there's definitely some, some things that we have to think about um, as we begin to rely increasingly um, on these convenient and accessible resources that push data out. Another example is object storage. Uh, it's in, in analytics systems, it's increasingly used as backing for tables, um, or all your data just lives out there. So, um, you know, being, you know, understanding how to, you know, how to, how to protect that properly, and most importantly, making sure that your database itself does not become an attack vector on object storage. So that's, I, I think that's an issue that's, it's kind of amorphous right now. We're, I'm, I know in our group, we're still kind of grappling with what the, what the issues are, but they're clearly important to think about. Um, yeah, so, and, uh, 
Another thing is to try and leverage Kubernetes as much as we can for, for security. So for example, certificates. Uh, um, every time I think we see a password around, we have to question, do we really need it? Or, uh, and if we can replace it with the certificates, it's much better, especially if, it, if it's, they're managed by a cert manager, which outside Kubernetes doesn't exist. You know, outside Kubernetes, nobody in Postgres is using certificates and renovate them regularly, okay? So we've got all these capabilities that we can use, and my, my advice is this, okay, to, to, to leverage the Kubernetes the most we can, okay, so. Yeah, and I think the other thing I'd like to just add to that, I think um, another kind of shifting paradigm in, in security-based authentication is to use things like temporary tokens. Um, I think that's a, another big one that is, um, I think will require changes in a lot of these workloads themselves to be able to support that, but I think that's a um, good trend to be going towards. Yes. Um, we want to open up if anybody has any questions for us. Please just go to the mic up here. If you're in the front row, I'll bring this mic to you. If <laughs> should be loud. Uh, so I have a question. Um, for those of us who are currently running inside of cloud environments uh, like AWS, GCP, et cetera, um, you know, a, a common pattern that at least I see is not leveraging, um, you know, a Kubernetes operator for a data plane when a cloud provider provides, you know, some managed service. And so instead using their managed service and exposing it inside of Kubernetes, um, you know, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, Especially if you, as an engineer, want to try to support, you know, something like, you know, operators on Kubernetes. How do you, how do you, uh, like, propose that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, obviously, cloud services want you to use their managed services. But I definitely do see um, a lot of users with multi-cloud environments um, choosing to run operators for the fact that yep. they can have a consistent stack across all their environments and no matter where they run. And so I think that's one of the main, um, you know, main innovations that Kubernetes has been able to bring um, to be able to have that consistent stack. And, but of course you have to like make trade-offs between sort of, you know, how much you need to manage versus how much like the provider can manage for you. And so those are trade-offs you're going to have to make. Yeah, I, I have a pretty strong opinion on this, which is that um, I think it's actually good that vendors are doing offering these services. But the key thing for you as a user is you should think about, well, what if that vendor service ceases to exist or they raise their prices or they cut us off because they don't like us? Um, so I think they're you know, just sort of moving outside of operators open source databases are the way to go. Operators are a key part of this because you can think of a spectrum of ways to, to run data services ranging from, you know, being in some, you know, something like Amazon RDS, which does a very creditable job of, uh, you know, managing relational databases. We use it ourselves in our service all the way to running it yourself with an operator. People should have that choice. And I think that it's really important. The operators are, are what enable people to say, I'm not going to use the vendor's solution because there's something that I can run economically and efficiently and safely myself. So I think operators are a super important part of this picture. But I think we should also recognize that people will move back and, and forth. And that's actually kind of an interesting issue. How do you enable people to move from you know, the operator-driven version of some database to using you know, some vendor service without wrecking their entire infrastructure's code. Yeah. So these are, these are things that, that I think we yeah. have to think about. And to me, I mean, multi-cloud, like Michelle was saying, vendor lock-in is another one, especially if, in a, if you are an ISV, probably you need to do multi-cloud in my opinion. The other one, especially I come from Europe, so for me, data protection is important. So it's really up to you and your organization to, to decide that. But with Kubernetes, with a good operator, with Postgres, you see where your data is. You have full control of your data. You can encrypt it the way you want it. It's yours, but that comes with, with responsibility. Okay, and that goes back again to skills, the skills you have. If you have skills in Kubernetes, you can even manage Kubernetes by yourself. If you have skills in Postgres, you can manage 
Postgres by yourself if you don't have them DBAS out of the way, you know? So that's, I think, my view. Uh, hi, I'm Tyler from University of Illinois. So uh, one t uh, takeaway I hear from this talk is that when when the user comes to like the open source operators, if they want to use the open source operators, they need to be very cautious about like um, what this what is the capability of this operator and how it can mess up your production. And I'm wondering, like as a community. What kind of tooling support you wish that we have, or we, what kind of tooling that we should work on so that we can improve the reliability of the operator so that the users can just like take the operators off the shelf and uh, then yeah. confidently run the operator in production? Yeah. I like you, you use the word mess. Mm -hmm. I mean, they also do amazing things, okay? But the good thing of an open source operator is that there's a community and you can join that community, okay? And you can help be an active part of that. But I agree with Michelle, if data are the most important asset you have in an organization and it depends on the size of your organization, you need professional support in my opinion for that. The community could be good, but you need, in my opinion, professional support to, to, to sleep, you know? I think this is a wonderful question, and my one word an or one two word answer would be CI/CD uh, support. So think about a typical example. Uh, I don't, does anybody here use Trivi uh, to do container scanning? Good on you. Yeah. Oh, there's another one. You guys get a free T-shirt. Uh, we use it too. It's great. It's just totally awesome. It, you know, it downloads in about 60 seconds, allows you to do scanning. We run multiple scanners because they all tend to get somewhat different results. But tools like that are just that these are things that enable us to build operators that are safe. Um, some of the other problems, like reliability, you have to solve that within your own code. I don't think there are tools that can do it. Uh, but fuzzing tools are another example of things you might might apply. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think um, I think you know all software has bugs. Uh, there's always going to be issues. I don't know if we can really. Um, create something that is truly like bug free that you never have to troubleshoot or debug. Um, and so I think that's that's just one of the realities that people need to tr plan for when they want to use an operator, especially an open source operator. And, you know, just to kind of be aware of sort of it's, you know, operators can definitely automate a lot and make your life a lot easier, but it doesn't completely take away the need for expertise. Okay, yeah, thank you. Nice talk. I actually have a question regarding the deployment of DBs on top of Kubernetes. How do you see it or how do you, what do you suggest your clients to do when it comes to deployment? Do we ha have to have uh, a different cluster only dedicated for DBs or do we deploy uh, pods uh, besides uh, workloads? And I mean, how? I think the answer is yes. They, every, I think both those models that you describe, and we've, we've thought about that because we have a model where um, one of the management models we have is where the control plane sits in the cloud and then we basically have the ability to form a management connection with our remote Kubernetes uh, that's owned by the user. And so then the question is, well, should they just run databases there or can they put their apps in there? And what we find is users have different choices and I think they, they usually have good reasons for for doing it that way. Um, I think our tendency increasingly is to see the, you know, the, the, the Kubernetes cluster as representing some larger application consisting of a set of services. So the operator ought to be happy about running in there and you know, maybe only managing something within a single namespace, but then have multiple other things that are running alongside it. And I think those, you, you want to support that model very well. Yeah, I agree with with, uh, with Robert, uh, it depends. Well, I've seen two patterns so far, you know, with our operator. One, you've got a large organization siloed between infrastructures and development. Infrastructure provides database as a service. So in that case, normally you've got a separate cluster for, for database. What I advocate personally is the microservice approach. So you put applications next to the database and applications on the database. Okay. So they are together. 
Okay, so, but it really depends, again, on, on your organization. And it all starts from day zero. The day zero is important. You choose the architecture and the storage. That's where if you mess at that level, you can't recover easily, okay? So. Yeah, I would also add, I think it, it's very dependent on sort of the, um, your whole platform and what you plan to run on it and how well behaved other pods might be that are running on the same workload. Um, I think the um, unfortunate state of Kubernetes today is that it's pretty easy to hose a node um, by having a runaway application just um, that's kind of unbounded. And so, um, you know, I think that it's going to depend on sort of how well constrained um, you put restrictions on, on, on all of the pods that run um, to help avoid any noisy neighbor issues. Yeah, and I, Michelle makes a really great point. Um, with data, databases are kind of special. They have been for 50 years. And so one of the things that databases often still tend to assume, because they're written long before Kubernetes, is that they have full control of the host. So for example, um, Postgres kind of assumes it has the buffer cache to play with. And, um, and if it doesn't, uh, Postgres performance will suffer. Same thing is true of ClickHouse. So, what we do typically is we will map the database nodes to single VMs or single hosts, if you will. Um, and so that's something you, you definitely want to have the operators able to support. And that's actually a practice which will then allow you to have the database run safely, performantly, without getting oomed, along with a bunch of other workloads in the same Kubernetes cluster because they're not sharing the same worker nodes. Yeah. And Kubernetes got affinity that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so. um, I have another question regarding the okay, operator. I think we're at time, though. I'm really sorry. I, okay. <laughs> I think there might be another talk happening, so we'll be outside if you all have yeah, other questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank we you. really appreciate Thank it. Thank you.